Hi guys, uh, it's Seb Krangle here. I'm the head home energy coach at Anova Community Energy. Um, this recording is um, as promised when we sent out the ebook called Maximizing Your Solar. Um, and what I'm going to do is um, answer some of the questions that have come in since then. And uh, yeah, if, even if you didn't ask a question, hopefully you'll learn something from it. Um, and I'll try and keep it brief within like 30 seconds to a minute per question, we've got about eight questions that have been, that people have sent in. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start with a, like a really broad question to sort of explain what we're talking about. And that is what is load shifting and how does it help me get the most out of my solar? <clears throat> so if you don't mind, I'll just read a, a, a brief paragraph on that that I've written. Um, so load shifting, is when you move some of your energy using activities to the daytime when your solar is producing, rather than leaving them to non-solar times like at, at night. This can be done through small changes in behavior, like when you do your ironing, um, to larger set and forget bigger ticket, ticket items like heating your hot water system. I'll talk more about shifting hot water systems uh, at the end of this recording. Okay, so why load shift? Why would you want to do this and how does it help you with your solar? So households with solar will always get the best return on their investment by using the power that is generated rather than selling it to the grid. This is true whether the feed-in tariffs are 20 cents per kilowatt hour or 4 cents. Uh, the reason being that when you use solar power rather than buying it from the grid, you are saving whatever you would have paid for that power, uh, which is likely 25 cents up to 37 cents if you're on time of use uh, per kilowatt hour. Whereas when you export power that you don't use back to the grid, uh, you're going to get a lot less than that and increasingly so as feed-in tariffs decrease. Okay, so that's just a, an overview um, of, of load shifting. And now I'll get into some of the questions that you guys have asked. <clears throat> so the first question, I have a relatively large six kilowatt system. Can I turn on two appliances at the same time and still only draw from my solar? All right, so the very broad question of that is most likely yes. Uh, it depends on what's called your base load, which is how much energy your house is drawing 24 hours a day. And that comes from things like fridges um, that are on all the time. So if your house has three fridges, then you're going to have maybe a base load of 800 watts at all times or more or less at all times. And so that you, it's always eating into your solar when your solar is producing. So um, the other factor is what are you turning on because and it's you know it helps to have a, a, a general idea of how much power each appliance is likely to be drawing um, but don't worry about it too much because you can do your head in trying to add up what's at all you know of each appliance and trying to work out am I going to meet your solar it's the sort of thing you have to worry about if you're off grid perhaps but being on the grid you know, the worst that can happen is you have to buy a bit of power to, to, to meet the demand. If you do want to get a little bit technical about it, though, if you take a six kilowatt system, um, the, the most it's going to be producing at any of power it's going to produce at any point in time is, say, five and a half kilowatts because of efficiency measures um, factors. So in the middle of the day, let's say a sunny day, you're producing five and a half kilowatts of power, you could, you could have your toaster on and your kettle simultaneously, because they probably use about two kilowatts each. And then you might have a base load of 500 watts and you could have all those things going and you'd still be fine. Um, however, uh, at nine o'clock in the morning, you might only be producing say two kilowatts or three kilowatts. And so, Putting all those things on at once, you probably wouldn't um, meet it all with your with your solar supply. <clears throat> but yes, definitely having a larger system makes load shifting a lot easier because you don't 
if you're trying to do it really, really well, you don't have to worry so much about what's on, how many things can I have on, um, which you do need to do when you have a smaller system. And if you have a smaller solar system, like a two or three kilowatt, then um, if you are wanting to have the majority of your energy use from your solar, um, then, then you need to be a little bit more careful. Like uh, if you put on the washing machine, don't go and do the ironing at the same time or turn on your power source or, or whatever. Um, but ultimately, as long as you, if you're not off grid, if you're still connected to the grid, there's no harm done. It's just that you won't get quite the financial return um, of, of, of keeping your energy use within, within your solar production. Okay, so I'll move on to the next question, um, which is, when I first got solar, I was told to get the largest system I could afford because the feed-in tariffs would ensure it would pay for itself. This no longer seems to be the case. What should I do? It's a very good question. So um, one way of approaching that question is to uh, reiterate that um, self-consumption of your solar, which means using the solar, the solar power you generate yourself, um, is always going to be the king when it comes to the, pay, the payback or the return on your solar investment. Um, exporting the power to the grid will, will always be a slower way of, of paying back your system, um, except back in the day when we were getting, people were getting 60 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, since those days have gone, um, exporting will never give you much of a financial return. It's sort of a bonus um, if you're exporting and, and you, there's nothing else that you need to do with that power. So that's the first point, self-consumption is king. <clears throat> the next one is that if you have a large system and you're not using a, a high proportion of it, you might have solar monitoring and you can see that you're only using 30% of what you're producing and the rest is being exported to the grid that's more likely to happen in summer. Um, one way of, of looking at it, and it's certainly the way I look at it, is that right now we are effectively in a transition period. Um, transition because, as we know, batteries haven't really taken off yet. I and mean, there's certainly a lot of people who have gotten batteries and are uh, you know, enjoying the benefits, but they're still relatively expensive. Um, and likewise with electric vehicles, that you know we're in a very early stages. Um, I, I and a lot of other people feel that they're very close to taking off and 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 gaining momentum in Australia. Um, but so before electric vehicles and batteries are really accessible and affordable, um, we're not going to really have the demand in our households for using the, sol the, the, the power generated by a large or an oversized solar system, and by which I'm talking like an eight or a 10 kilowatt solar on an, an average two, three person home. Um, however, that's not necessarily a bad thing because what, what you're effectively doing is getting prepared for when you it is affordable to get a battery uh, and when you can afford to get an electric vehicle and then you will need all the power you can get um, and that power won't go to waste that you're unlikely to be exporting it to the grid you're going to need plenty of power to charge your ev and or your battery uh, and your battery will let you use that power, renewable energy through the night so um you're going to need a lot of solar and having it now already is a, is a good thing, I think, partly because it allows you time to fine tune how much power you need uh, in your general day to day living without something like an EV. And it also enables you to do things like um, to, to right size your battery. So if you know now, for example, that 
you're only exporting five kilowatt hours of, of, of energy per day on average, say in winter, <clears throat> which is my actually in my case, I'm only exporting three in winter because I've got a lot of trees shading the house. Um, that tells me, well, I can only really have uh, about a four kilowatt battery because I need to be able to charge that battery every day. And um, you need to effectively, you need the power that you're exporting now will go to the battery. You, unless you get more solar put on, um, you won't have any way of charging that battery unless you charge it from the grid. <laughs> and if you got a battery that was way too big and you weren't able to charge it every day, you will uh, detrimentally affect the life of that battery because it's not fully cycling. <laughs> so that's getting a bit technical, but the short answer is um, having too much solar isn't necessarily a bad thing at this point in time because it helps you get set up for the future. And it's just, we're in a limbo in a transition because feed-in tariffs are dropping drastically. Um, we're not earning money from exporting solar. You might not have enough activities that you can do in your home to uh, use that solar. So you have no choice but to export it at this point in time. And you're not getting a great return on that. <clears throat> So hang in there. Next question, which is a bit of a broader question, is um, what are some creative ways of using excess solar? So if you, if you do have a system that's bigger than what you need um, and you're exporting it to the grid and uh, you don't want to, you want to use it, you don't want to get excessive and, and increase your consumption just for the sake of it, um, what are some things you can do? So um, here's some ideas. Uh, electric lawnmower is one that I've dabbled with. So let's think about how can I do more things with electricity that I otherwise have been doing with petrol or some other, some other way. Um, and particularly if there's batteries involved. So, you know, I can't afford um, a, a big battery yet, but I can afford an electric lawnmower or electric whipper snipper and um, instead of having a, a, a power tool with a, with a cord I can get one with a battery and that means that um, I can charge the battery in the peak of the day when I've got plenty of solar and use the power tool whenever I want. Um, the same with with a lawnmower or whatever you don't like have to mow the lawn between 10 and 1 in the day because uh, it's battery operated. <clears throat> Um, some other ideas are with cooking, you know, if it's not practical to cook your dinner at lunchtime, which is would be the ideal to use solar power for, for that meal, uh, you could use a slow cooker. So it takes a bit of planning, but, you know, prepare the, prepare the, the, the vegetables in the morning or meat or whatever and uh, put it in the slow cooker and it will cook all day with very slow amount of power. And you've, hey presto, you've got a meal at the end of the day that is cooked with solar. Um, you could, off, you know, if you've really got excess power that you can't use, you could offer to charge your neighbor's batteries, you know, um, community service, you know, rather than, rather than selling it to the grid. <clears throat> Uh, if you have a pool, uh, always good to put your, uh, um, the pool pump on a timer so that it's, it's running during the peak times of your solar production. Uh, preferably only for four or five hours, play with what the minimum is that you can have your pool pump on um, and have it on time. Don't have your pool pump on at 6 a.m. when you don't have much solar production. <clears throat> Um, and the next one, I, mean, I, talk, I spoke at the beginning about big ticket items. And the idea behind that is, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort to be aware of load shifting smaller items, like because they require you to change your behavior, you know, whether it's washing, cooking, ironing, mowing, whatever, um, to, you know, I have to do them during the day. You know, you might be one of the lucky ones in going to work. Um, these days and and you can't work from home and and do some of these things during the day so 
we need to think about what are some of the things we can we can load shift that you don't have to think about that, that are automatic um, and particularly things that use a large amount of power. So we're not talking about small change. So for example, you put a dishwasher on, do a lot of dishwashing at 10 a.m., that's great, but you're only going to use up one kilowatt of power, say, on average. Um, however, a big ticket item like your hot water system, uh, in general, we use between five and six, sometimes seven kilowatt hours. And ironically, most of us have their hot water systems um, on controlled load, so they get heated in the middle of the night. And more and more so, what, what people with solar are doing is going, wow, there's an excess of solar power now in the grid in the middle of the day, and I have an excess, I'm selling it to the grid. Why not use the your solar hot water as a form of battery to store the power from your solar. And then you're using it whenever you have a shower. Hmm. So it's, to me, it's one of the biggest best solutions and the South, South Australian government is doing it um, with demand response. They're taking control of people's hot water systems uh, as a way of soaking up that excess solar energy during the day. How do you do it? That gets a bit technical, but there's a couple of quick options, which I'll, I'll tell you about. The first one is you can ask your electrician, especially a solar electrician, to install what's called a solar diverter. And that's a very intelligent device which goes, okay, your solar is exporting um, two kilowatts of power. Like it's getting to the point where you're, you're not using two kilowatts of power. I'm gonna send that to the hot water system. And then the cloud might come over and you stop exporting, it'll stop heating your hot water system. And it'll do that through the day um, to make sure that your, your hot water system gets enough power and that it's all from solar. So they're very, very handy device. They do cost about $800 to get installed. Um, an example is a brand called Catch Power. Another way of doing it, which is simpler but not as intelligent, is um, to get your electrician to put a analog timer in your circuit board um, on your hot water circuit. And so you can set that timer whatever time you want. For example, 10 to 2, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. When, you, when your solar is most likely to be, be exporting to the grid. Um, there are some issues with that, like cloudy day or rainy day. Um, you, you might not be, depending on how big your solar is, you might not be producing enough. So you do, you might then have to draw from the grid and it will be at like shoulder rates. So you will pay more on those occasions than you would have if your hot water was on controlled load. So I'll leave it at that. If, if anyone, if you wanna ask more questions about something like that, feel free to, to email me. Um, I'm sure we'll have a, a link to my to my email and the same applies to any of the things talked about today uh, if you've got follow-up questions just email me and i'm happy to answer you answer those questions okay a uh, couple more questions um which one should we do uh is it worth spending the money on um small benchtop ovens uh, for small cooking jobs instead of using my gas oven? And the answer is generally yes. So a lot of us have quite large ovens that are either electric or gas. And yet a lot of the, the, the oven jobs we have are smaller, smaller heating and they might not suit a microwave, like if you, a pie, if you don't want a soggy pie. So um, a, a bench top, even though it's another, another thing for your kitchen, um, it can be good in terms of saving energy in that you'll use, it might only draw one, one kilowatt or two kilowatts. And without you having to turn on an oven that's, that's, that's three kilowatts or it's run by gas, which is a normal renewable resource and you're wanting to use as much of your solar energy as possible. So it's a good uh, compromise where you're using less power and you're using electrical power. So yeah, I like small, um, and the other, other option is like an induction cooker. You can get portable induction cookers. And I've got one next to my gas 
stove that came with the house. So whenever I can, whenever it's suitable, because I know my solar is producing, I will use the, the induction cooker rather than use gas. <clears throat> okay, good question. Um, so that might be it for questions. Oh, one, one more, just a little bit oblique, is this person, Glenn, was asking, um, says, hi there team, I have a 16 kilowatt battery system along with solar. Have you got any tips on how to make the most from my system? So that's a big battery and probably a big solar system, um, and which is, you know, he's obviously a first, adop a first uh, adopter and good on him. Um, my main tip would be if you're trying to maximize the value or the return from that system, then um, what you're wanting to do is you, you'd probably be on a time of use tariff rather than a flat rate tariff. And then um, you're charging your battery during the day and use, then using that the power from the battery in the evening when you would have otherwise been paying peak electrical rates, probably 37 or more cents per kilowatt hour. And that, that's the key way that a battery can, can help you save money for, for starters, energy and money, by um, en enabling you to use renewable energy in the evening. It doesn't have any environmental benefits because that the power that you're putting into your battery would have otherwise been sent to the grid um, and for someone else to use, which is a good thing. Um, but for you personally, having a battery means that you can then have more power to or more energy to, to use at times when electricity would be more expensive. And otherwise, the satisfaction of, of knowing that the majority or all of the, the energy you're using is from renewable sources. Okay, so that's probably about it, guys. Um, thanks for listening. And like I said, if you have any further questions, um, feel free to, to email us. Uh, my, my role at ANOVA is as an energy coach. And it's, it's, it's what I do, helping households um, to reduce their energy consumption or, or any excessive consumption, um, to give advice on energy efficiency. So making your, your home more efficient so that you don't need to use as much energy and also advice on renewable, renewable energy. So happy to help. Thanks guys, see you around.